Our next speaker is uh, jo Professor John McDermott, um, who's coming up the stage now, who is the director of the uh, LRF-funded Assuring Autonomy International Programme, which was established earlier this year. So I'm assuming, John, that you're going to tell us all about that. Thank you. I'm going to tell you something. So good morning, ladies and gentlemen. It's, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, I'm going to talk um, quite a bit about Assuring Autonomy, and then at the end talk about the programme, which, as the chairman said, um, started at the beginning of this year. Um, unlike um, Adam, I'm not perhaps such a great fan of the, the Chinese classics, but my, my favourite book is the Oxford English Dictionary, which shows how sad I am. But um, the dictionary says that autonomy is the ability of a person to make his or her own decisions, all self-governance, independence, and so on. We talk about autonomous systems. So this means that the system makes a decision, not the humans. Now this is very topical. You'd think this was invented in the last year or two. But actually the idea is um, not so new as I will explain. I'll also come to talk about what happens when we transfer this decision making to machines. But if you go back, you know, only a few years, we invented electric kettles, and they turn themselves off automatically. Okay, not a great decision, but it's still um, a level of autonomy. Um, many of us will have cars with adaptive gearboxes, which actually change when they um, alter gear according to driving style and all sorts of other things. And we now get some rather more sophisticated things. Does this work? Such as robot vacuum cleaners, which will um, go around your house, it will design itself a strategy for getting around the rooms most efficiently and most effectively. But of course, like many things, actually, it's not so new. This isn't back to BCE, but this is back to 1495. It's an autonomous cart um, designed by da Vinci. I don't know that he ever built one. There's a, there's a lovely museum uh, at Vinci um, between uh, Pisa and Florence where they've actually built some models. Of course, it's just clockwork, um, but it's an uh, autonomous cart. Coming up to more um, recent times, the, the military have ha perhaps done more in autonomous systems than other. This little example I'm going to show you is the first autonomous flight off an aircraft carrier done by um, the Americans off the coast of Virginia. This is a, an X-47. I say this is a, a short video clip from the first flight. I think one of the things to, to, to watch, which is really interesting, and I'll come back to this issue, is interaction of the people and the technology. The guy in the yellow jacket is in control of the aircraft. Um, and what he does is he tells it when to go, and somebody else presses a button and it flies autonomously. But he goes and does that, which is exactly what he would do if there was a pilot in the aircraft. Then it all works, and it fits in exactly the way the aircraft carrier normally works. So if any luck, it will now go. So, ready to go, and the automation thinks about it for a bit, and then decides, yeah, let's roll. It does on it. There we go. Don't look at the thing on the left. That's a, a chase plane that's filming. He comes in to land. And those of you who know about helicopter operations will know, sorry, aircraft carrier operation, you know it's a perfect landing. There, there are three arrestor wires. He's picked up the second one, which is what you're meant to do. You're meant to hit the middle. And it gently rolls to a halt. You notice everybody walks around as if this is you know, quite normal, Se several, several tons hurtling along at several um, hundred, hundred knots. It integrates into the systems perfectly. So we're going to talk about autonomy, but we also have to think about how these autonomous systems interact with people. So we can build these things. Why do we want to do it? Um, the answer is there are potentially huge benefits to society, to, to commerce, uh, from do doing so. And I'm going to um, explain a number of ex examples. So one of the most obvious things is involving... Uh, sorry, avoiding tasks that are boring, repetitious, dangerous, um, slow. For example, work in factories and, and warehouses. So the, the picture at the top um, is of um, some technology um, used by um, Ocado in their warehouses. Uh, these little robots run on a, 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 a matrix on top of towers which contain baskets of, of groceries. Um, the robots are made by a company called Tarsus up in Blythe in the north of, of England. 
Well, understanding is when you um, ordered from a card and they did a manual pick. It took an average maybe a couple of hours for people to go and, and pick the groceries to be delivered. And it's now about 10 or 15 minutes using this robotic system. So it's actually dramatically um, increased um, throughput productivity. Um, I'm sure it saves the company money, but also takes people out of doing very boring, boring and repetitious work. Um, the, the picture at the bottom is about um, social care, and there's a growing need for support for um, so social um, care in, in the community. You know, some of the predictions of um, the, the demographics in, in Europe you know, suggest that by 2050, um, you know, there's going to be something like 30% of the population um, over, over 65, and so the ability to support them living independently is going to become uh, increasingly important. And, and this example here is a, is a Japanese robot that's subtle enough in what it does, it can actually pick up and carry uh, a, a disabled boy, which is what you're seeing there. Um, I'm going to talk in a bit more detail on following slides about some things in the area of shipping and also in the um, area of, of driving, driving on the roads. But uh, one of the reasons for doing um, shipping as an area of, of autonomy is to remove seafarers from, from harm's way. We still lose a lot of lives at sea. Um, and it's said that in driving, um, many of the accidents are due to human error, the statistics that, that demonstrate that. And actually, one of the driving motivations for Google getting into autonomous cars is that um, one of the guys who led that had a, a, a friend who was killed at the age of 17 by doing what 17-year-old old boys do when giving powerful cars. Um, the problem, of course, in the latter is it doesn't think how often the human beings actually avoid accidents, which we tend not to monitor so well. But I'll give you some, some examples. So the next picture is an example from the maritime world. Um, at this stage, we're actually talking about remote operation, um, not full autonomy, but on the track there. So this is a little tug um, by a company called Switzer. Um, she's quite cute, 28 um, meters. Those of you that have ever driven around uh, Dodgems on a fun fair will think this is a little bit like a, a, a Dodgem car with, with the, the bumpers um, around the front. They're actually quite, quite important because often actually they push these up against vessels and, and, and the pilots actually feel um, the impact of the vessel when they're, they're steering other things. But, but this uh, chat was modified um, in, uh, in build to include um, lots of extra sensors and some control systems so she could be operated um, re remotely. Um, this next picture shows um, the remote operating center uh, built by um, Rolls-Royce in, in the Nordics. Um, this was um, done mainly, mainly in Finland, although the operation that I'll show you in a moment uh, was done in, done in Copenhagen. So um, the captain has this um, nice white leather um, seat, a, a bunch of screens in, in front of him. The screens show um, composite imagery from um, radar, lidar, and, and optical sensors around the vessel. Uh, if you look right at the top, you can see he's also got something rather like a reversing um, camera there. Um, after operating this, they asked for things like wing mirrors at the side so they could look down the back. One of the interesting things is this is far, far better situational awareness than they actually have on the bridge. Because in most weather conditions, they can't see anything like this well. And interestingly, they asked the captains if they were happy without haptic feedback. You don't get the feel of the motion of the vessels. And they said, that was absolutely fine. Except they could really do with a bump sensor so that when the vessel actually hit something, they knew they'd actually made firm enough contact. But they were happy um, otherwise apart from that. So they can control the vessel remotely. So what, what was done? Well, roles under the watchful eye of the Lloyd's Register group, um, did some trials in a, in a harbor in, in Copenhagen um, uh, about six or seven um, months ago. So what they did is, in manual control, they took a tug um, away from a berth in the harbor, put it over to um, remote control. You can see the control center um, here. The, the captain in the control center took the vessel through the harbor to another berth, turned it around, took it back out, uh, and handed it back to the um, captain 
um, on, on board. So there's always a, a human on, on board, but it was commanded um, remotely for a period of time. And they, they did not, uh, a huge number of hours, I think 16 hours of, of trial operations, but this was the first time there was a remote control um, commercial vessel um, in what was uh, public waters. Will they make money out of this it, it, in the short to medium term? No. Um, actually, what you need to be able to do is to do something much more challenging, is actually to have um, multiple vessels um, overseen by a single individual. So imagine I'm going to send four tugs out to go and move a big vessel, and I have one captain looking after four of them. That way you save money. This way it costs you money because you need all the technology on the vessel and exactly the same number of captains. So you've got to do more to be able to make money. More likely, the first step, though, in bringing this to um, commercial um, reality is, is things like this. Um, ferries in, in the Nordics, there's quite a lot of short um, car ferry routes. There are many, many islands in the archipelagos between Sweden uh, and Finland. Lots of these ferries. If you can see the truck on there, you can get an idea of, of the size. So um, the first commercial operations with this technology are likely to be these sorts of, uh, of, of ferries. So they're not traveling very long distances, but they can build up um, experience and knowledge uh, of how these things actually work in, in practice and feedback and improve the technologies. So these things exist to an extent. They're being um, developed progressively to become more capable and more widely used. And I, I've mentioned this role's work because I, I have a little bit of visibility of it, but there's other similar work in the Nordics, people wanting to do a literal movement of, of vessels along the Norwegian coast, for example. Now, um, I said at the beginning that the definition of autonomy is about humans making decisions. But if the decisions are made by a computer or a set of computers and some software algorithms, how do we know that those decisions are good, appropriate, right in some sense? And how do we know they were ethical? Interesting, the conversation a moment ago about Cambridge Analytica really draws on the, on the ethical angle. Um, I don't, in the limited time I have available to talk this morning, intend to go into the ethical dimension very much, but that is something we do need to be concerned with. So modern autonomous systems um, use uh, machine learning, artificial intelligence, if you prefer. Now, one of the interesting things then is how do we know that what has been learned is appropriate, is right, is safe? And maybe we ought to ask the question about ethics there as, as well. So there's a technical question, but there's also a human dimension of this. How would we give confidence to the users, to the public, um, to regulators that systems are safe to operate, safe to put into service. And I'll, I'll come back to the role of the program in a moment, but that's really the space in which we're going to um, operate, uh, are operating in the program. So now let me look at this uh, again in the context of autonomous um, driving. And I said I, I would talk about this um, as, as well as the maritime environment. So people may recognize this is a, a Tesla um, that hit a concrete um, barrier um, on US 101. It was a, an Apple engineer who unfortunately was um, killed by this. And in essence, the car couldn't make up its mind um, which side of that barrier to go um, and hit it um, head on. The, the driver was actually extremely unfortunate only because of, of that, of the technology. But if you look, if it comes up, um, oh, come up, in the bottom left-hand corner, you can see there's a compressible barrier at the end of this uh, concrete wall, which absorbs energy if you hit it. Somebody hit it about three days earlier, and they hadn't re-extended it, so we got none of this um, uh, energy dissipation through hitting that, so effectively the thing went at, at speed into that. Now, it does appear this is a bug in the algorithms. There was a report a few days later of somebody else with the same model of Tesla who drove it on autopilot down this bit of road, and, it, and he said, you know, it kept changing its mind which way it was going to go, it was going to left or right, and so he took back control and didn't do the same thing. So it seems like there was an underlying problem, and I will talk about a different underlying problem in, in, in a moment. But this leads me on to the question of assurance. Why is assurance hard? 
So um, assurance is confidence or certainty in the ability of a, of a system. Actually, we're never going to get certainty with many of these sorts of technologies. The world, the environment is too complicated, and it's not static. So even if we had absolute certainty today, we wouldn't have tomorrow because the world would have changed. So what we normally do in building complex computer-based systems is we test them. Testing is a jolly good idea. You find out when you've misunderstood the world and you can correct things. So how do we test? Well, let's just give an idea of the enormity of the testing problem. Um, I've heard figures from, from people in Volvo who say that um, in the West, there's typically 3.7 million miles driven between fatalities in road cars with drivers. It's a long, long way. So there are some really impressive autonomous systems. You know, the Google cars have done a long way. Um, there's an independent company um, in this country, Oxbotica, who have done some really fantastic work technically on autonomous driving technology. Um, they've got a, a base on the, on the Cullum site um, south of, of Oxford. Their vehicles have done about 10,000 miles. 10,000 is not a big proportion of 3.7 million. They've done those 10,000 miles on that site. Have they done 10,000 miles or one mile 10,000 times? Which is more compelling? But there's still this vast gap. So can we do something else? Can we somehow prove what the algorithms have done are right? Um, can we show what they've learned is right? But actually, often what they've learned is invisible. If I say I got an artificial neural network, what it does is it learns weights for how the different neurons relate to one another. But those are not exported. We can't talk about them. We can't reason about them. There's also a question of knowing whether or not we've covered um, all scenarios. And, and this next picture relates to this um, fatality with, a, with an Uber car uh, in, in Tampa, in, in Arizona. And this, this picture, um, you see the guy uh, in the car. He was actually um, there to, to monitor the behavior of the vehicle. There's actually, I've just shown you this, this single, still there is a video of this, but it's actually quite disturbing. But if you can find it online, you can see he's not paying attention. He's looking down a lot of the time, not looking out of the window. But this is a, a still at the point that the lady who was uh, as killed um, is, is clear, in, at least in that image, and the fact he's just realized that she's there. We don't know yet what happened. The, the Transportation Safety Board is investigating this. Um, the um, online rumors are saying that the systems detected this, decided it was a false positive, and said there wasn't anything there and carried on. So if that's correct, then that says one of the real problems is we have to be able to classify objects. Now, I I'm guessing, so please don't say this is true, but my guess is that the algorithms were trained on bicycles um, with no people. Bicycles, somebody riding them. But what happened if it wasn't trained on bicycles being pushed? This doesn't look like a bicycle. So it could be that the algorithm said, hey, I don't recognize this object, so it's a false positive. Don't know that's true. But whether it is or not, that shows just how hard it is. For a human being, it's perfectly obvious what that is. If I've not trained an algorithm, then uh, we have a real problem. And I have a real problem about timing. So I shall just do two more things and then um, draw to a close. So, um, as I've just illustrated here, in most cases, um, these systems are not fully autonomous. We have to be able to interact with people and understand how um, people um, interact as, as, as well. And how do we sure, can we assure that the human understands what the system will do and the systems can um, work out what the people are going to do and how the people judge the behaviors of others, whether they're um, systems or machines. I shall show you one last video and one slide, and then I'm going to um, have to uh, draw to a close there. Has anybody ever been to Hanoi? Ever crossed the road? So what they tell you in Hanoi is it's really straightforward. You walk in a straight line at a constant speed and don't make eye contact. So this is how you cross the road in, in Hanoi. Um, the gentleman, as you see, is quite elderly, so this has clearly been a successful strategy um, over um, a large um, part of his, his life. You notice there's also a pedestrian crossing here, which is ignoring um, 
totally. Now, what we need to do... Oh, that's interesting. It stopped. Maybe I'll, I'll press next and it'll carry on. That's interesting. The video has stopped. Uh, oh, there we go. Uh, and he crosses the road, and, and they all miss him. Um, and actually, interestingly, he runs right at the end. He cheats right at the end. He starts to, starts to run. That's how you cross the road. Now, we need to make our autonomous systems realize that that's the norm in that culture uh, and support it. So I, I will finish on this slide, and apologies. There's a, there's a few more things that I, I won't have covered. So um, why is uh, regulation hard? It's because assurances, but there are lots of other complications. How does autonomy impact liability? In this country, we're trying to write um, some laws about autonomous vehicles, which will probably place liability on the driver. Is that really right? Um, how do we investigate accidents? How do we get enough data, particularly if the algorithms have learned in operation to um, know what caused that so we can learn from experience and, and correct it? How do we write rules and standards that protect the public yet don't stifle um, innovation. And this is a real problem because many of the current standards conflict with or even um, preclude autonomous um, systems. Now, I apologize, I, I do need to stop. I've, I've, um, I've enjoyed myself too much in talking about those. But um, the um, foundation um, had this review of robotics and autonomous um, systems. And very fortunately, we, we got a program of, of work funded through that starting um, at the beginning of the year, I was going to flick through these slides and leave you the last one. We started at the beginning um, of the year um, on a program that's looking at these issues with the aim really of ensuring that the, the real benefits that can arise from robotics and autonomy um, are actually um, realized um, whilst ensuring that these things are, are safe in, uh, in, in operation. That's a really... Um, complex endeavor, but one that I'm delighted um, to, to be leading. And we need to make this a real international activity. And I hope as a result of this, some of you from uh, other parts of the world will, will get in touch with us so we can actually build an international um, collaboration to solve these problems. And there's some contact details for you if you wish. So ladies and gentlemen, apologies for, for overrunning. Um, perhaps there's time for some questions. Thank you very much, John. I um, was one of the people that put my hand up, um, having said that I've been to Hanoi, and you've brought back flashbacks of just how horrible it is trying to cross the road, and, and actually how quickly you learn, though, that if you don't cross the road like that, you're just not going to get anywhere. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah. yes, there's time for questions. If, if anyone would like to... Yes, in the front row here, please. If you'd like to wait for the microphone, thank you. Uh, thank you. It's Mark Stokes from Lloyd's Register. And thank you for that fascinating um, presentation. You mentioned that the benefits, one of the benefits of, of robotics and autonomous systems is to take people out of boring and repetitive work. Yeah. And, and w I'm trying to frame the, the question correctly, because the presumption is that, and we hear it a lot, is that in the future we're all going to be enjoying our leisure time and be immensely wealthy. But somehow I feel those Ocado pickers and those ex-Uber drivers are somehow not going to be enjoying sitting around swimming pools, enjoying their leisure time. The, the, what are your views on, on the future of autonomy and ha what it means for the workforce in the current political and economic system, which doesn't support that redistribution of wealth? Uh, that, that's a very big and, and complex question. I'll, I'll give you a, a somewhat um, narrow response. You know, we've had a number of industrial revolutions. I haven't noticed people being out of work and with nothing to do, and I, and I think our society will accommodate to that. People, people will do different um, things, different sort of work. But also, you know, one of the aims of this, this program, which is very broad, is to look at some of the issues of those that might actually be displaced or actually have their jobs changed by this sort of te technology. Um, probably in, in York, we wouldn't lead on that part of the program. We'd actually work with others um, to deliver that. And, and so, for example, some of the work we're doing in, in the maritime area, there are places like Warsash that train seafarers if they have to move from operating ships to being monitors and supervisors, actually to work with those people to help retrain people for these different roles. I think there will be a bigger shift I hope what it will mean is people will end up moving towards doing more, more interesting, more flexible 
um, styles of work. And you know, just straight I if we can put it that way, is changing you know, various professions like um, um, you know, auditing, accountancy, and so on. And by and large, it's the mechanical stuff that's being automated, the more strategic things for the people. And I hope that's what will happen, but I can't prove that it will. Great question. That was my backup question, in case no one had uh, put their Thank hand you. up. I've been talking quite a lot about that topic with various people over the last few months, and it seems mm -hmm. to be a, quite a, um, a topic that's of the moment and in the public ag agenda. Yeah, I but think so. There's a question over here. Scientific advisor, uh, very interested in the autonomous boat yes. and the picture that you showed of the captain in a room surrounded by computer yeah. screens. Yeah. Do you think there's a danger that we shift from one hazard to a completely different hazard, which is people being in a room on their own, lonely, mental ill health? And what do we need to do to assure ourselves that we're not reintroducing hazards? when we're removing hazards that might be more obvious? I mean, that's a very good question. I mean, my, my, my simple answer is you need to do, um, still do safety processes. There are some things that are different because of autonomy, but actually fundamentally we need to do the same things. And if we're going from an, an as is system to a 2B, we need to do the safety analysis of the 2B system. And, and the particular question you ask, I think, is very pertinent. There's evidence from people who operate um, remotely piloted um, air vehicles, this is actually very stressful. And if anything, the crew is, is bigger with remotely piloted aircraft than it is with um, human piloted um, aircraft, although you get different benefits of, of endurance. So I think it's a very pertinent um, question. I think that needs to be looked at as, as part of an overall assessment. Although it's actually shown like that as a single individual, I'd be truly astonished if it wasn't like that. Um, yeah, so if it was like that, and, and Rolls-Royce have some interesting videos uh, of one is uh, of a, a remote command center where they have, as well as operators, they have people looking at maintenance and all sorts of other things. So there's actually a team who collaborate on dealing with problems with vessels. And I think that's actually much more um, realistic about the way this would, this would work. Oh, wonderful. One more time. My name is Maria Long from the University of Surrey. Um, I think the psychology around uh, AI or autonomous uh, autonomy is, is, is fascinating. Um, and giving assurances to public that may use uh, this technology um, is important. But what about the assurance of security and cyber security? What role does that play in part of this development? That, that is within the scope of the program um, that, 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 I'm, that I'm leading. We haven't started working in that um, area yet, um, but it clearly is very significant. It, it, it's, it's fairly obvious, I think, that um, cybersecurity problems um, can end up having an impact on safety, in some sense perhaps more so um, with autonomy, where there isn't a human intelligence to, to determine um, the, the, the abnormal situations. What I expect we are going to um, develop or, or build on, because I already work in this area, is combined cybersecurity and, and uh, safety assessment uh, processes. The critical thing here is actually you need to understand how that analysis brings about trade-offs between safety and security and should actually um, impact um, the, the system uh, d design. And again, we've already done some work with people where when you look at this, you realize that in some cases, safety has to trump um, security in order to um, actually get the, the right balance between the risks. But if you look at them independently, I think you're in real trouble. You have to look at the two um, in, in a combined uh, way in order to end up with viable system designs. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So, so John um, confided in me earlier when we were micing up that he was going to be misbehaving on, on the lectern this evening, but, but this morning. But uh, I think you've behaved impeccably. So. I said I overran. <laughs> Thank you. Not Thank so you. <laughs>